It's voting time all across the UK. Polling stations are being set up so everyone over the age of 18 has the opportunity to take part in deciding who governs the country. But how would you feel and what would you do if as you approached the polling station you were stopped and told you don't have the right to vote? In 1789, the monarchy in France was overthrown in a period known as the French Revolution. There was a lot of bloodshed ending with the beheading of Louis XVI. As power structures changed, the people didn't want all the decisions to be made for them. They began to demand suffrage, which means the right to vote. In 1819, in St Peter's Field, Manchester, a crowd of 60,000 protesters had gathered to demand the reform of parliamentary representation. The combined pressure of famine, unemployment and the relative lack of suffrage in Northern England increased demand for political radicalism. 18 people were killed during the protests, four of which were women. One of those women, Sarah Jones, was killed after she was truncheoned over the head by a police officer. <laughs> women were at the heart of campaigns for electoral reform at the turn of the 19th century. However, the nature of the subsequent reform failed to reflect the calls for women's suffrage. The Great Reform Act of 1832 mainly enfranchised urban landowners and those wealthy enough to pay over £10 rent a year. The Second Reform Act of 1867 doubled the number of enfranchised men from around 1 million to 2 million. Agricultural farmers and tenants were enfranchised, helping to bridge the gap between urban and rural areas. But women still didn't have the vote. Women were deemed a distinct and inferior species. The Prime Minister Herbert Asquith famously said, a woman was no more qualified to vote than a rabbit. At the time, the Victorian feminine ideal, women were expected to be subservient, a wife and mother who was selflessly devoted to her children, their fathers, husbands, priests or politicians made important decisions about their lives. An angel in the home, while she, too gentle even to force his penitence by kind replies, waits by expecting his remorse with pardon in her pitying eyes. It's 1866, and a group of women discussed the campaign for women's suffrage. Men were not discouraged from attending these meetings, but the focus was on women and discussing the issues that affected their rights and status in society. From these meetings, they established the Women's Suffrage Committee, first in London in 1867, and then similar societies were founded in Manchester, Edinburgh, Birmingham and Bristol. Yet it was predominantly middle-class women at this stage and their focus was on campaigning only for women householders to have the vote on the same terms as men. Publications such as the Women's Suffrage Journal start spreading new ideas. In the next 30 years, the non-violent suffragists focused on constitutional change, which did not prove successful. However, in 1897, the National Union of Women's Suffrage Societies was formed by Millicent Fawcett, and progress quickened. Finally, in 1903, the Women's Social and Political Union was formed by Emmeline Pankhurst 
With the slogan, Deeds Not Words, the tone of the movement had now completely changed. Pankhurst has been widely criticised for her militant tactics, but she is recognised as a crucial part in achieving women's suffrage in Britain. At this time, every MP representing people across the country was male. Having a female monarch on the throne had not really helped women. Queen Victoria described votes for women as a mad, wicked folly. Many people regard the suffragette movement as a movement of middle-class women. However, working-class women also fought for the right to vote. In the 1900s, deputations of working-class women went to the House of Commons to speak to the Prime Minister about their working-class conditions, as they wanted to benefit by getting more and better rights in their working environment. Annie Kenny was one of these women, a working-class suffragette who became a leading figure and part of the senior hierarchy of the WSPU. The suffragettes were being noticed now. Their movement garnered attention from the public and from the government. They became a group of interest needing to be watched. And with their newly acquired zoom lens, the police could do just that. Photos of any suspects were developed and doctored to remove any brutality. Reports were written and targets analysed, but the suffragettes had created a way of counteracting this by coding their diaries, which entailed their acts. However, the police managed to decode these, giving way to raids on their bases and public arrests to make an example of them. But this didn't dissuade the women of the movement. Intent on spreading their message to all corners of the social climate, they increased their visibility. Posters and postcards were produced and plastered all over cities, and soon the suffrage movement had caught the eye of the general public. Many women, and even men, and some priests, found it easy to agree with their goals to achieve a universal right to vote. The first ever large march organised by the National Society for Women's Suffrage took place in February 1907. The march was made up of over 3,000 women from different social classes and even some men. The weather that day was so horrendous that the event was later called the Mud March as women trudged through the wet, cold and very muddy streets of London to campaign for women's suffrage. As the suffrage movement became more well known among the general public, Membership of suffrage parties such as the NSWS increased dramatically, with almost 50,000 active members by 1914. However, Parliament still refused to take the movement seriously, and this caused some women to take more extreme acts of protest. Women of the movement were now willing to risk their lives in order to try and achieve their aims. To some, these acts of militant suffrage were acts of terror, but it was equally met by terror. Violence escalated between the suffragettes and the police on the 18th of November 1910, the day remembered as Black Friday. Over 300 women marched to Parliament in protest of the failed conciliation bill, among them the daughter of the Maharaja of the Punjab, Sophia Dalip Singh. The women were not only prevented from reaching Parliament, but were brutalised in the process, to the extent of physical and sexual assault. A demonstrator recalled her ordeal. My left arm was black and discoloured, till one more twist would have snapped the bone. The activities of the suffragettes meant that they were arrested and imprisoned in institutions such as Holloway Prison in London, which became a home away from home for many women. Throughout the campaigns, around 1,000 women spent time in prison in total, many of them several times. However, despite their political motivations, women were not treated as political prisoners, but instead as common criminals, unable to receive letters or wear their own clothing, and they lived in horrific conditions. But even here the women protested. One way was to refuse to eat. These hunger strikes eventually led to force feeding. Emily Davison recalled that, Four or five wardresses came into my cell with a wooden armchair, seized me in spite of my holding onto the bars of the window and carried me screaming shame across the courtyard to the remand hospital. I was carried up the stairs, clinging to all I could seize and then fed by force as quickly as possible. My clothes were torn open and I was then put into one of the cells nearby.
An extract from Olive Worry's medical report, 8th of July 1914, stated that At the present time, she is very thin, one may say almost emaciated. But in addition to physical condition, I consider that her mental state has become more unsatisfactory. Her irrational views on social things in general, her lack of moral fiber and her habits of cunning and deceit all point to the fact that she cannot be credited with a full measure of responsibility for her actions. To avoid bad publicity, the government passed the Prisoners' Temporary Discharge for Ill Health Act. This meant that hunger strikers would be temporarily released if they were too weak to remain in prison. This was commonly known as the Cat and Mouse Act. Emmeline Pankhurst said at the time, I will never forget the screens of women being force-fed as long as I live. Still, Parliament was not willing to budge. Would things ever change? Women had to take the men's place of factory working while the men went to war. Factory work was dangerous and there were many casualties. However, women were able to prove that they could work just as well as men. Women also had to work in hospitals because of the huge amount of war casualties from soldiers. As victory came, it was clear that anyone expecting women to return to their pre-war domestic roles was going to be greatly disappointed. After what happened in Russia, Parliament was scared that a major revolt could take place in Britain. And so in 1918, the representation of the People's Act was passed into law. Overnight, 8.4 million women could vote. In two years, Britain had its first female MP, Nancy Estor. It took a further 10 years for women in the United Kingdom to gain voting rights on the same terms as men. This finally happened with the introduction of the Equal Franchise Act in 1928. From that time until now, women all over the world have been slowly gaining the right to vote. Just as important as equality of suffrage is that parliaments and governments reflect the society that they represent. The suffragettes didn't just fight to gain the vote, they campaigned to be involved in the decisions that shaped their lives. Through their determination and resolve, they made those in power understand that no matter the circumstances of your birth, this is your right.